Hey everybody, can I have everybody come and join us? Slide it comfy bean bag, slide it comfy chair. Make sure you've got a fresh beer in your hands. It's time to get the night started. Um, before we before we kick off, next slide please. I'd like to hand over the floor to a moment uh, to Calypso Harland, who's been helping us out behind the scenes today. She missed our Three Musketeers moment on stage in the morning. Come on up. Calypso. Calypso has recently launched Dub Lab, and together with UCL Decide here today, they're out launching at Over the Air 13 device. Well, um, uh, first things first, um, I want to uh, you know, raise a glass to, to Maggie and, and Dan and Matthew and, and all the people have helped organize this. So um, cheers to uh, everyone who made this such a great event so far. <laughs> on, the, on the subject of drinking, um, I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for a conversation I had with Ian Masters over at Tequila at the last uh, Angel Hack Aftermath. And uh, we were discussing about how we could make uh, devices available to developers for free. And uh, so Ian came up with this great idea. He's like, well, Firstly, uh, you can go and approach all the handset manufacturers and you know get them to you know donate devices to the cause. But <coughs> why don't we get the community to donate their legacy devices as well? So um, anyway, that's what we're here to do. Um, we're going to provide you free devices as part of uh, the device program, and uh, we'd like you to donate your legacy devices um, so um, everyone else can take advantage of them as well. So. Um, Anyway, uh, Alice is going to explain a little bit more how that works, and um, and at the end, we'd love to uh, get a show of hands about uh, who wants to get involved in the program. Uh, for the punchline is, I've no idea how this is going to work. Yeah, but um, uh, we're trying to uh, support and sort of intervene in various ways in the mobile industry. We've uh, been working with Mobile Monday for quite a long time now. Uh, we've got sort of education programs like the Mobile Academy for people that sort of want to get into a slightly different area of expertise. Um, and devices are sort of ne next step uh, along that on how we provide uh, services. So this will be an open device library. You'll donate a device, you'll be able to check in and out for development testing. Uh, we've got one other quite significant announcement that you'll have to wait till tomorrow morning. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so who wants to donate a device for the program? So they get all their hands on uh, all the latest devices out there for free. Show of hands, any frontiers? Yeah, sure. Well, great, that's someone, a brilliant show of support. Someone take a photo. That's great, and those of no you who are too shy, please just uh, text hash device to the over the air uh, um, Twitter stream and, um, and we'll follow up with you. And, and please feel free to reach out and, and have a chat to us. Um, <laughs> anyway, thanks, guys, it's great. <laughs> up is Dan wearing his Telefonica digital hat because it's thanks to Telefonica that the Ignite Talks are sponsored tonight. So beers on Telefonica digital. And Dan, can you tell us a word about the open agenda? Hi, don't worry, this will be brief. Um, the open agenda is basically an initiative from Telefonica digital uh, to throw some energy towards open stuff. So we're focusing on open web, Obviously, the Firefox OS stuff that we're involved in is pretty heavily in, in, connected to that, but also open data, where Telefonica Digital is working with the Open Data Institute, and uh, open innovation in general, including open source development and stuff like that. So basically, there's a web portal at theopeninnovation.com. Um, they want to use the hashtag, hash the open agenda. Uh, it has to be the open agenda. So um, if you uh, are moved to tweet, uh, during these talks, and your tweet has something to do with openness or open open source, open um, open innovation, open web, etc., open source. Uh, then please feel free to use the hashtag the open agenda um, and kind of get involved in the conversation around that. And in general, there's some good video content, and some good articles that are being posted to the Telefonica Digital blog, which sits behind the 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 web address, the open agenda. Dot com. So that's it for me on the open agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Then can I have the next slide, please? Because we are kicking off with our Ignite Talks with Cristiano, who's now a pro at this kind of thing. The Ignite Talks are a tricky format. As soon as I hit the go button, 
They're going to move automatically every 15 seconds on Cristiano here. And he's going to tell his story in five minutes. Ready, steady, go. Hello. So I'm going to talk to you about how I, uh, I went from a geek to an event organizer. Um, this is not supposed to be the first slide, is it? Um, so... You were going to take the first one off, remember? So uh, six years ago, I moved to London, and I, uh, I went to Over the Air, and I loved it. Um, I went to a lot of events. I don't know if how many of you were there, but we've had some crazy stuff at Over the Air over the years. We've had some Daleks, and Ewan, who is sadly not here today, but he's done some, some uh, silly stuff. There's also been Mash and Hack London over the years, which Matthew has been involved with. Um, I think next year we should have an Ignite talk with just crazy photos of Matthew, just 20 of them. Um, the I started to get hang of it at some moment. I started to hack and I started to play around. And a cherry hack at one of the years I won. There's kind of a couple more of the winners here. Um, there's a lot of crazy stuff happening there. Uh, this is Tom being shocked um, for nothing. Um, but there's a lot of other events in London too and all around the world. There's bar camps. This is just some of the icons of some of the bar camps that have been out there. Um, at a certain moment, I've been to Bar Camp London two till ten. Uh, almost, and quite a few more. And I started to get the hang of other tinier events. So there's the London uh, Girl Geek Dinners that I used to go to. There's the Design Jam. And there's a whole lot more events just on Lanyard and on Mia. And at a certain moment, I got kind of trapped into organizing the London Geek Dinners because Ian moved to, um, to Manchester because he's a bit of a coward and he thought Manchester was nicer than London. So, um, yeah, we kind of got roped into that. And from there, it was quite easy to then go and organize a bar camp, which he also kind of left us with. So we started to organize these events, and we did Bar Camp London 6 till 9, and we're now looking for a venue for 10. Uh, but eight, Bar Camp London 8 happened to have fallen through, so we ended up having to do a kind of a backup event for the people who already had booked their train tickets and stuff, and we called it Hack Camp. And that was kind of our first, you know, attempt at running a hack day. Um, eventually, this got me hired at PayPal, just organizing these events. Uh, I'm now running 10 hack days across the world, of which five in the U.S. and five in Europe. So technically not across the world, but just a certain part of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but in the end, <coughs> um, this year, we finally tried to kind of emulate kind of these big hack days like Over the Air and uh, Hack London. And we ran our own event called Hacked. Who here was hacked? Uh, hacked. Yay. Cool. And the rest of you, you missed something. So hacked start when Kevin went interviewing at O2, and he got a funny question which said, what would you do with £100,000? And he said, I'd run a really bad hack day. Uh, so they said, cool, you're hired. We're doing that. Um, now, we didn't spend £100,000, but we did spend a lot of time trying to find the budget in a venue because, of course, they didn't have £100,000 just ready to sign off. Uh, we wanted this building pretty much from the start, and we ended up getting it, at least a really tiny bit in sight. But of course we needed a lot of money. Um, these are just some of the sponsors that were involved. Uh, some of them are here. Um, a majority of it was paid by O2, it was Telefonica in some way. You can't do these big events without these kind of big sponsors, but you also can't do them without these kind of production companies. When we talked to these production companies, we were like, how much are you charging us? It was totally worth it like the video production and everything that they brought, you wouldn't believe. Um, in the end, we had a great event. We had 494 people, 496, I think. We had about 75 hacks. We had a lot of fun. The Wi-Fi went down, you know, proper hack day. Um, so I want to kind of finish it up and kind of give you advice on how to do this yourself. I mean, if you want to start running events, I'd recommend starting small. Don't start by trying to do a hack. Start by doing a geek dinner or a tiny evening event. Um, the other tip is don't do it alone. This is just some of the volunteers from Barton Loan 8 that we have, and this doesn't even include security. This doesn't include the cleanup and the catering. This is only for 250 people at an event. You need to bring it with other people, otherwise you're going to go mad. There's a Hack Day Manifesto at hackdaymanifesto.com. Uh, it's just full of interesting tips and tricks, and it's just a guideline for how to run a hack day and how to you know, keep yourself uh, from going insane. Um, it's kind of, if you want to make a change, just make a 
pull request. And, you know, maybe one day, five years from now, you're going to be running hacks. Because uh, I think after all the insanity, we don't really want to anymore. <laughs> um, finally, if you want any more advice from us, uh, we're all at geeksoflondon.com. Uh, we're in Geeks of London on Freenode in RSC. And, yeah, send me an email if you want any advice. Cheers. Thank you, Christian. Can I have the, the, uh, the slide here, please? Uh, it is there. Fantastic. Daniel Kerr. To tell us about a beginner's guide. <laughs> the great book. Oh, he, has, he was actually serious. I feel bad now. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now you do it. <laughs> Ignite karaoke. There's something in there. <laughs> oh, not who's like. There you go. Yeah, so uh, I've been doing a bunch of teaching on JavaScript right, lately, and I thought, ah, oh, Ignite talks. I could do. I could. I could spend five minutes teaching everyone a new language. Then it turned out I needed to find a really simple one, and that ended up being BrainFuck. Um, BrainFuck is a Turing complete language, um, kind of appropriate as the man himself's office is just over there somewhere. Um, it was built as an experiment to build the smallest possible compiler on the Amiga, and it looks a little bit like this. Um, it's comprised of eight different commands, and every one of them is a form of punctuation. And this is where the name comes from. Um, but how it works is you get a big bank of memory cells. Um, I say big, but it's actually about uh, 3,000 byte size memory cells, so 3K of memory. So you're working with similar kinds of constraints as many of the computers over in the Museum of Computing, which if you haven't been to see, I highly recommend. Um, and it works by, you get a pointer that operates within that, memory, that bank of memory cells, and you have various operations that either operate on the pointer or the data that the pointer is pointing at. First of which is you have the um, uh, you have the move left or left, right, one of those. Uh, <laughs> and this 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 is to help you navigate through the through that bank of memory. Move the pointer by one. And you have its inverse which will move it the other way. Um, and you you generally have you will have to move cell by cell. Um, so if you want to move three cells, you need you need to, to basically tend to move three times. You also have increment. This will look at the cell that the pointer is over, and it will increment that value. Um, when it gets to the, top, uh, the maximum value, it will generally wrap around and start again at zero. And the same for minus. And when it gets to the zero, we will um, we'll fall through the bottom and start at the top again. Next slide. Go. Um, the dot. The dot is dot's an important character um, because it prints. So it will look at the character that sorry, it will look at the byte that is under under the pointer, and it will render that out as an ASCII character. And the comma is its inverse, and that will read a read a ASCII, ASCII character in via standard input and store that in the memory cell as as it's ASCII, ASCII um, numeric value. And then we have the brackets. Um, so brackets are effectively used to implement ifs and loops. So this is effect effectively the start of a while loop. And while the value under the pointer is is positive, it's not zero, it will, it will run the code. And then when it gets to the corresponding closing um, square bracket, it will jump back to the the first one, if the again, if the um, the value is is uh, non-zero, but but yeah, you end up with complicated code, and this is just this is just to print out the word "hello world," um, and it's like it breaks down into a lot of really simple um, simple steps. But if you try and actually write a 
brain cup program from scratch, you're probably going to get into a lot of trouble. So generally you try and work out what you want to do, what the steps are, and then you start to translate that into brain clock. But as I said, it's, it's a very good, what caught my interest about brain clock, um, but way back in the 90s, this was a language created in 1993 by a guy named Uwe Müller, um, I believe, sorry. And it's, it's a very similar language to if you're implementing a, a virtual machine. If you, or in my case, it interested me because I wanted to build emulators. Um, I'd seen the Game Boy emulators out there, and I thought, oh, I can do that. Um, turned out I couldn't, but I did manage to do BrainFuck, and that was, that was quite an accomplishment at, at that point when I was just starting out and learning to code, and it was some of the first C code that I wrote. And one of the, um, one of the great things about it is its simplicity, is it transcends all primates, and there is a variation called Ook, <laughs> specially crafted for our orangutan brethren, and it maps every one of the commands onto a combination of oops. So, yeah, that's all that, folks. And I hope I've encouraged you to all go off and start coding in BrainFog. Thank you, Danielle. I don't think this one's going to be my programming language. Can I have the stage cast? And I will get your presentation properly started. Ready, steady, go. Hello, I'm Kaz, and I've been a passionate photographer for longer than I care to admit. Since the beginning of 2008, I decided to do a personal project where I take at least one photograph every day. I kind of forgot to stop, and I'm approaching day 2100. During that time, I've been doing various different side projects, the craziest of which is called Face Down Tuesday. There's a flippy group for this thing, <coughs> why not? This was one of my first attempts in a local park, nobody about, during a frosty morning. <laughs> then I decided to go to uh, Newcastle to visit friends, and I took my trusty Disney lightsaber with me, as you do. And um, I thought, well, in front of the Blinking Bridge is a good uh, venue for another Face Down shot. No Geordies about, I can't imagine why. Then I went to Florida with some geek friends. The very last day we were there was a Tuesday. How convenient. Our villa had a pool, so I decided to set this shot up. It did mean I went home with wet clothes in my case, but I didn't really care too much. I've been back at the BBC to do some engineering contracting um, uh, for a few years. My old bosses know me very well and I'm completely barking, and one of them even lent me his toolkit here as a prop for this picture in the new studio N9. <laughs> Last summer I was at uh, the BBC's new premises at New Broadcasting House doing some acceptance work on the new equipment. It was a bit of a building site and we were forced to wear personal protective equipment such as um, a high-vis jacket and the, the steel toe caps. The hard hat wasn't mine, I did borrow that one. During the summer, um, the lady that runs the Face Down Tuesday group came to visit London. She's from Holland originally. And she came for a week and she said, who would like to meet me on a Tuesday for some face down action? I was the only person that turned up with her. We'd been, um, I've also been during the period uh, searching for these Wenlock statues that were to do with the Olympics. And we had a great fun and, and discussed how much uh, a crazy global phenomenon face down Tuesday has become. Well, talking of the Olympics, I managed to get a ticket for that te from that terrible website um, for the athletics. And, uh, hey, presto, it was a Tuesday. So I thought, well, I've got to find a, a suitable venue um, to do my face-down shot. I found a quiet corner, nobody around. And thankfully, I didn't get arrested or thrown out. I spent most of uh, September last year in Japan on a fabulous holiday. All of the Tuesdays I was abroad, so I really had to find a particular um, venue for, for my Japanese shot. And I flavoured it with a little bit of local... Um, props as well here. Well, this year I decided to, to wrap down a bit, and I haven't done a Face Down Tuesday once a month as I had previously, but just when the opportunity arises. So I went for a winter walk and tripped over and got a face full of snow, and there we are, the Winter Starfish Edition. Back at the BBC during March there, this time at the political unit in Millbank, and um, this is me with my accomplice Monica filming around behind the back projection system. <laughs> Thankfully the local politicos weren't around, but it could have been a bit awkward. <coughs> and then I went back to Television Centre for a couple of weeks after virtually everybody else had gone. We needed to be there for a particular, uh, to man a particular part of the building. But it was great for Face Down Tuesday. I ran around like a loony taking as many shots as possible, 
and nobody was around to ask me what the hell was going on. <laughs> this is the former sports department on the fifth floor. Um, they'd moved out and gone to Manchester some time before, and it was, uh, I thought, well, I'll wheel myself up there with a few packing crates just to sort of, uh, you know, see what the place is like. Amazing what you can find wandering the corridors of Telecentre. Now, being a good engineer, I knew that it wasn't a good idea to plug these in because those bulb holders would have been live and there was nothing to stop me electrocuting myself. That's not what happened here, I must say, but um, the green tea bar. One of the places I used to love when I worked at Television Centre a lot. I bought so many cups of tea at the place, but sadly it's not served a cuppa for many, many months. And the counter here, just, you know, having a reminisce about all the cups of tea I've drunk in the past there. Myself and another colleague did a lot of urbex during our lunch hours, and we'd go around and, and poke in places that we'd never seen before. We found the Scenic Artist Workshop here, where they used to paint the, the backing cyclorama cloths, complete with a few props, which was rather good. Now these escalators go from what used to be old main reception down to the old VT in the basement, but I was rather pleased that they weren't working and haven't done since the late 80s, because I would have been tipped on my head and it wouldn't have been a great shot. The Blue Peter Garden. A sad shadow of its former self. Most of it's been relocated to Manchester along with the rest of production. But this is me smelling the grass one fresh spring morning. And finally, when you think to yourself, why does she do it? Well, it's a bit of fun, and why the hell not, really? Why Tuesday? I don't know. Ask Chantal. Any other day, just be planking. Can I have to the stage, please, Mr. Tim Potter? Hey, ready, steady, go. So, um, I decided I'd do a career-limiting move and talk about secrecy here. Um, so, I, I claim our society is actually built on secrecy and, and that it's, in some senses, a good thing. So you look at things like religion. Religion is predicated on the idea that you can tell your priest anything and they presumably won't tell, tell anybody else but from God. And likewise, your doctor. Your doctor, you should be able to have a private conversation with them and be reasonably sure that your doctor's information won't get abducted. So if we don't believe that secrets can be kept by professionals anymore because the infrastructure doesn't allow that, do those institutions still work? Do they have to change? Or do we have to try and get that secrecy back? And there are other institutions that arguably might matter even more. Things like the legal system are based on, again, predicated on the idea that you can keep a secret. Your solicitor can keep a secret. And the markets are all based around release of, controlled release of information, which is another way of looking at secrecy. So how do you restore trust in secrecy? <coughs> well, I'm a geek, so naturally I have a geeky answer. There's, there are political answers, but in deference to our hosts and other people, I'm not going to discuss the political. But there is a technical idea, which is we could use WebRTC. Now, I'm kind of obsessed with WebRTC at the moment, but it's browser-based, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's real-time, it's voice, video, and data. So it kind of covers all the communication bases, but it also has a set of attributes that make it interesting from the point of view of, um, of secrecy. It's open source, it's got strong crypto, and there are multiple independent implementations, which means that it's kind of less vulnerable to being attacked. And it's also, it's decentralized. You've all got it, or you're, you've got, um, in your Chrome and your Firefox, you've already got it. There are a billion places where it is already. There are millions of web programmers who, who can use it, and, but, so it's decentralized, but it's vulnerable to a set of targeted attacks. I mean, if somebody attacks your computer by adding a keylogger or hidden microphones, it's not going to try and stop that. But it will stop a set of other sorts of attacks, which have become recently um, discussed, around retrospectively decrypting data that was opportunistically captured. So, you, you know, a call is captured and then played back later when you become an object of interest. So, WebRTC is actually vulnerable to one particular sort of attack I want to address, which is man-in-the-middle attacks. So somebody is listening in the middle of, between you and your peer, somebody is listening to the call in the middle, encrypting it, decrypting it, listening to it, and then encrypting it on the other side. 
And because of the way the crypto is set up in WebRTC, you can't actually immediately tell that that's happening. Um, and that's unfortunate because it kind of negates the whole thing. What you need to know is that the encryption was carried out by the other party and not the person in the middle. Now it turns out that actually that information is available in WebRTC, but unfortunately it's available in a format that's really inconvenient. It's this. You have to compare those, that with your peer and decide if they're the same number. And that's impractical. So, um, there, are other, there are other technologies that do similar sorts of things. There's um, uh, ZRTP and the Silent Circle guys. They do the same sort of thing, but they use different crypto. And what happens is that you call the person and then you read this much shorter string uh, over the phone to the other person, perhaps. And they have to check that you're not being impersonated. But in principle, that does it. But listen, this is the web. It's not a phone. We ought to be able to do better. Where about you see you're sitting in front of, you know, you're sitting in front of a megapixel display. You've got stereo microphone, you've got a mouse, you've got a camera, you've got geolocation, you've got JavaScript, you've got all these things that you could maybe use to build a better UI. So I had some really bad ideas about how you could do that. Um, you know, you can compare kittens. Mine's running, mine's <coughs> fighting a penguin. So obviously there's somebody, well, there's somebody in the middle listening to this because they're not the same kitten. Um, or you could, like, play a tune and something like that. So basically what I'm saying is I'm a crap web designer. Um, this isn't my skill set. I understand about the crypto, I understand about the technology and believe it, but I need a web designer who can come up with a way of, well, doing this, of um, comparing two 32-byte strings in a user-friendly, web-friendly, secure way so that people can have their secrecy back. Um, so it's a challenge to you guys. Um, there must be some competent web designers here somewhere, and, you know, that's a problem for you. Come and, come and help me. Go. Okay, so I'm jumping straight in with analog cinema, and with this I mean um, cameras and projectors using actual film reel. Um, so this kind of all started in 1892 when William Dickinson and Thomas Edison came up with this universal format, 35 millimeters. It's 35 millimeters wide and using four perforations high, um, which basically turned it into a four by three. Um, frame. Um, and normally when we're talking about aspect ratios, we actually um, divide it so that it's um, the right one is a 1, so it's one for free free ratio, we call that. Um, and this is kind of the typical thing that's used in televisions. Um, so in the 1950s, when TV became more popular, cinema started thinking we needed a different thing to make um, people still come to cinemas. So they started looking at widescreen. Um, so we have different types of uh, widescreen um, formats which all came up in the 1950s and none of these actually took off. Most of these ones all created the, the, the well, screen size by using, uh, by flipping the lens. Um, <laughs> these are the two, the two that actually did survive were CinemaScope and this used an anamor uh, anamorphic lens in front of the camera um, so that it would basically skew the, um, the actual size of the image. And the other one is 185, which uses a cropped image. So it uses actually free perforations, but it blanks out um, the top and the bottom of it. Um, so this wasn't actually possible in the 1950s because of the quality of um, the film stock. And it's only in the 1980s that, this, uh, that Kodak invented T grain, which allowed us to um, create a way, uh, well, come up with a way better as, um, quality of, of film stock so that we could actually use less of the actual film. Um, but nowadays, digital cinema is what is actually um, being used. 90% of cinemas in the UK um, now have digital projectors rather than analog projectors. Um, so we kind of take a step back again to television, and um, the aspect ratios there, they came up with a um, compromise format that took the 4x3 and the 235 and combine those together, um, creating a 16 by 9, which everyone kind of knows. Um, so this kind of allowed for the 235 formats to still be shown, 
and for the 4 by 3 to be shown, both with the same amount of white space above and beyond it. Um, so this is kind of what is being used everywhere um, in home cinema, and that's why we're kind of using um, 1080p nowadays. Um, so when we're talking about 1080, um, it's 1080 vertically and 1920 horizontally. So in digital cinema, we're talking about 2K and 4K. So you'd think that this means that 2K is more than twice as much as 1080. Um, but that isn't actually the case. Um, so this is kind of how the two relate. 2K actually represents the horizontal um, amount of pixels used, um, which I had no idea. So I really found it cool that that's actually the case. So if you compare 2K to 1080, it's pretty much the same. 4K, on the other hand, is way bigger. Um, so um, most projectors at the moment in cinemas are 2K. Some of them are slowly stepping over from right to 4K. Um, so it's kind of, it doesn't make, it make a difference um, which of the two you go to. So yeah, analog cinema. And this is where it kind of gets a bit flaky because when we're talking about analog film, um, there's no real um, well, translation of one to the other. It sort of fits in between here. So when we're talking about analog film projectors that are still using 35 millimeters, that's kind of where it fits in resolution-wise. Um, but it's a very flaky type of um, um, translation. Um, and then finally, I kind of want to talk about IMAX. Now, IMAX is, I find, awesome. Um, but a lot of people don't realize what it actually means. Um, so things, uh, so with IMAX, they use 17 millimeter film rolls. And it's not only twice as large in the one direction, they actually flip the image, so a way larger um, amount of screen is used. So finally, when we actually start comparing IMAX formats to all the other ones, you get that. And that's pretty much why I think IMAX is awesome. Um, and that's my talk. Much more fun to go to the IMAX next time with a bit of background information. Could we get Chris Sinjaku to the stage, please? Oh there you go. Ready, steady, go. Hi, so uh, my name's Chris. I'm a software developer. I've been doing that for two years properly now, and then three years pretending you what I'm doing. I uh, was doing at uni on some open source projects and all like that. Uh, most recently, I've been learning the Ruby language, programming that I've worked for about a year. Hands up, who has written a line of Ruby or so? Good, that's enough. If you haven't, this is fine anyway. Uh, there's not that much in the talk. So, I quite like Ruby, and the main thing I like is the readability of the language. So, I find, at least compared to the Java I was writing before that, it's a lot easier to understand what is going on in a typical Ruby program. Um, and for me, that's really important. That's probably one of the highest factors in you know, me choosing a library or a language. Something I'm less keen about in Ruby is the abuse or overuse of monkey patching. Now, very quickly, if you don't know what monkey patching is, that is, at runtime, opening up someone else's class, stuffing extra methods onto it, changing the ones that are there, or generally doing other bad stuff. And hopefully it's obvious why I don't like that. <laughs> it's... Kind of, you're breaking into the encapsulation of that class, and you know you don't, you just can't know what's going on. And the problem is, if everyone started to do that, it would be chaos. It would, you'd have you know people replacing each other's methods, and you know, or oh, I'll have my version, but no, I'm going to overwrite it. So only a few people can get away with it. You can't all monkey patch, especially if you're looking at the core types. So one place that's relatively heavy on monkey patching is Rails, which is probably the most popular piece of Ruby software on the planet. And in Rails, there's a library called Active Support, and it does a whole bunch of monkey patches to the core types of Ruby, including integer. It monkey patches integer to have a day method, and you can call a go on what that returns, and it gives you back a date object, which is yesterday, which reads really nicely. That really satisfies the code readability thing that I was on about. But it doesn't you know, quite work with my technical license. So I should mention very quickly that in high school I learned Spanish. And I realized the other day that in Spanish you wouldn't have to do any monkey patching to get the same level of readability. Because the way they say one day ago is hace un día, it's a go one day. 
So you could just have a helper module which you'd include, which would have that method on there. So it kind of struck me that to get that readability, it was we were doing something kind of nasty, this monkey patching, but it was because of the natural language we spoke. And it struck me that the order of words in natural language is a bit arbitrary. I don't really know much about you know the history of languages and that. But it strikes me as something that's completely arbitrary, whether we say ago one day or one day ago. Uh, in English and Spanish and a whole bunch of other languages, we use, they're looking at verbs, we use subject verb object, cat, play with, string. To me, that looks like OO code. And I started digging into this, and I realised that there are a bunch of languages that do verb subject object. The Celtic languages are one set. So perhaps this looks a bit more like functional style programming. So play with cat string. So there's almost a kind of predisposition, perhaps, in the natural languages we've learned from birth that forces certain compromises, or at least tempts us into them, when we're writing code. And I find this kind of interesting, because we've got, on the one side, code readability and understandability is, I think, so important. But, you know, on the other side, maybe we're trying to pretend that the computer is understanding what we're saying when really it's not quite. There's a kind of, we're trying to force the syntax of our natural language that we've learned from birth into the structured syntax that the computer understands. And I'm not going to come out and say that one or the other of these is the right choice, because I'm not trying to preach and say, you know, monkey patching is an inherent evil and you shouldn't do it. But it strikes me as you could go either way with that discussion. And perhaps there are, you know, equally readable alternatives. I know that's not valid English, days ago one, but we can probably all understand what's going on there. So, you know, which side of the line do you fall on? For me, it's quite an interesting debate. Um, I've never seen a language do this, and maybe someone should write it, but if you could move the arguments to a function before the function at your option, you could do one day ago, and that would work, but maybe there's a good reason we don't do that, and it's a little bit crazy. Um, I do still like Ruby, so I don't want this to come across as me, you know, say, drop Ruby, go to something else, no monkey patching, but I kind of think it's worth re-evaluating why we go down the routes that we do, and what has influenced the design decisions which forces into sort of technical compromises and perhaps it's worth looking at different <coughs> approaches. I don't know if that one day ago with the weird arguments before the function would be a good idea but maybe that's the kind of thing we should look at in new languages that we're creating um, that's all I got Thank you really interesting talk about so the underlying logical languages <coughs> Mr. Manfred Gornschlag, you're already on stage, and I need to get you all set up here. Ready, steady, go. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Manfred, or Manfred Bo on Twitter, and tonight I would like to talk about evangelists and onions. So for the last uh, three years, I've been working as a developer evangelist, and tonight I would like to present a little model which I developed, putting together a couple of best practices. Um, this model is called the Onion model, uh, but to start with, what is a developer evangelist? Well, the Greeks say, um, so evangelism is a Greek word, and it means bringing the good news. So I hope tonight I can actually indeed bring some good news to you, or at least um, tell you some, some useful stuff. Um, one definition I came across recently says that um, a developer evangelist is a technology person trapped in a marketing person's body. Um, I'm not so sure about this definition, but what I'm sure about is that this role is very new um, and indeed, uh, because of this popularity of uh, open APIs nowadays, it is very much sought after. Um, the, the work of a, de of a developer evangelist is um, very diverse. A developer evangelist needs to cover uh, a lot of different roles. So these are things like, um, oops, something went wrong with your... Mac, yeah. um, anyway, so um, he has to interact or he has to cover or interact with roles such as development, uh, marketing, uh, product management, um, support, PR, and even uh, sales. So sales is something where um, developer branches are not so keen on, but it's also part of the role. So in order to cover um, all these various uh, roles, uh, usually a developer evangelist um, has to or should have quite, quite diverse uh, skill set. The first and most important one um, is, is passion, if you can call that a skill. 
secondly, it's coding. So as, a, as an evangelist, you must not lose touch to code. You should have a strong web presence, or at least know how to use it. Uh, public speaking is a great uh, part of that job. Um, communication in general, and also networking. So networking in the virtual world, as well as in the real world. So, um, as I said, over the last three years I was working as, a, as an evangelist, and I sort of put together a couple of best practices, which I tried to represent as an onion. So, at the core of this onion, there are three main pillars, which are the pillars of an evangelist's work. The first one is events. So events is really the bread and butter of an evangelist. You have to go to events, you organize events, or you present at events. The second pillar is communication. So that's all the classic stuff like um, email marketing, RSS, or also, of course, uh, social media, such as Twitter. And the third pillar is then content creation. Now, what I mean with content creation is um, developing apps, sample apps, give them away for free so that people can learn, uh, tutorials, and getting started that kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, at the bottom, there is a foundation which I call uh, sensing the market. So it's really important to, to go out there, understand your, your community, understand your developers, um, know their pains and potential gains, and feed this back into the world. And then, at the top of it, um, is what I call acceleration, because you're never alone, so when you work in your ecosystem, you have partners, try to leverage this partner network to, to increase the outreach and to accelerate your message. So that's the, the inner core of the onion. Um, the next layer or the next ring uh, around that is, is partner engagement um, or pilot partner engagement. So um, this is beneficial for two reasons. The first reason is because you get immediate and very honest uh, feedback about your APIs or your products. And second, if you have a successful pilot partner uh, project or, or product out there, you can actually use that as a success story or as a case study. And that leads into the third ring, which is general awareness activities. This is where you work with um, PR people, uh, PR agencies, again, to reach out um, to your community. Um, so, the work as a developer evangelist is certainly very challenging and very diverse. But if you have a really good product, or a, a dice product, as Kawasaki called it, it's a hell of a lot of fun. Um, of course, at the moment, developer evangelists are high in demand. Um, the role is very, very diverse, but you don't have to be excellent in everything. Um, I would suggest focus on your talents, do what you really love to do, and focus on that. Um, yeah, I write a lot, a lot about um, developer evangelism and mobile strategy. If you're interested, uh, check out my tweets. And with that, I would like to thank you and wish you a fantastic over the year. Thank you very much. classic translation error between the development team and sales. Really <laughs> <laughs> subtle visualization there. And to wrap up tonight, we have Mr. Dom Hodgson. If you could make your way to the stage, please. I don't have to follow Ooh. small ones. <laughs> you got to end on a high, right? I tend to get really excited and talk really fast when I talk about Disney World. So. Hey, ready, steady, go then. Uh, it's just that, was not it? Uh, hi everybody, uh, last year we went to Disney World, uh, me and some friends here, it was got very exciting and as a geek I can tell you that in Disney World there are things I can only describe as magic. Uh, we spent a lot of time organising it and next year we're going back um, and what I want to talk to you is how we organise Disney World. Some people say it's to the extreme, some people say maybe not. It's also my honeymoon that we're going for and we're going with 12 other people because that's not weird. So one of the things that we have here is a small spreadsheet which has all the park opening times, uh, the parks to go to, the percentage chance of rain, um, which, what parades are on, which parks are open to the latest, um, which, which uh, days are the busiest. This is one of the ones where we're looking at booking tickets. So we've got the amount of people in our group that want to go, uh, how many days we think we're going to go, what's the price, what it works out per person, what it works out per hour. This is what happens when geeks go to Disney World. And you can see here, this is one of several tabs. Um, you can't see up there, but we've got a walkie-talkie spreadsheet where we work out how many different types of walkie-talkie we've got. There are three different series of walkie-talkie. We've got a chat room. We then break down down here which car we want, because which one can we get the most fuel out of, and which one has the best radio. Um, so why do we do this? Why, why, why do we plan our Disney World trip so much? And it's because it's amazing. Like, as a geek, there are things, again, I can only describe as magic. It just, 
it's the only holiday where I got upset going home. And, and I'll talk about that the first road we ever went on when we got there was a Monsters Inc. ride. And basically you sit there and you're watching this screen with two monsters. And they're, they're interacting and talking and you think, ha ha. Then they suddenly ask the audience a question and they react live. And you're like, what? And then you realise that I've gone to, like, we'll come back to that. Um, and sound. So the sound engineer, if, if you go to the space area, as soon as you enter the space area, the frontier sound stops. There is no crossover. Every single part of that Disney world has been engineered, so you cannot overlay stuff. Disney Quest. Anybody been into Disney Quest? It is an arcade on five floors where everything is on free play. They have the latest machines. They have the oldest machines. It is absolutely amazing. I could spend two weeks there, but I don't because Disney World's amazing. Magic Kingdom. Uh, if anyone's ever been to the Magic Kingdom, you don't know. It's actually built on the second floor because underneath the floor are a series of tunnels that all the staff go into. So if you're dressed in costume, you don't want to go through Frontierland because it would look weird, a cowboy going through the space line, wouldn't it? <laughs> Hidden Mickey's. This is my favourite Hidden Mickey. Anybody do geocaching? So hidden Mickeys are geocaching for Disney geeks. Everywhere throughout the park, there's hidden Mickeys everywhere, and you'll see them. There's books you can go around. They're a bit weird, and that's me calling them weird, and we have a spreadsheet about cars. <laughs> parades, right? I, I, I love watching the parades, um, but like this, right? You can't see through there. How do they drive? They have no tracks. It's not magnets, I've checked. But like, <laughs> if somebody runs in front of them, they stop. I haven't checked that. But, and the animatronics, there are, there, like, there's some really old animatronics in there, but some of the new stuff is just absolutely incredible. Uh, there's a bug life thing, and I'm not the best fan of spiders, and one of them came down and they all dug on. I nearly got two kids as I ran out, because I don't <laughs> like them at all. I just, this building here is just amazing. I just love looking at it. But also, that's a ride that you go in, and you go up, and it takes a picture of you, and it splices it on uh, to a character, and then it emails you. And this is a ride from, like, 30 years ago, and you're like, monorails, right? Who has a monorail in the UK? <laughs> Nobody has a monorail in the UK. You get to go on a monorail. It's the first thing you see. And the monorail goes through a hotel, and when you go through the hotel, everybody in the hotel waves. <laughs> it's <that> not amazing. <laughs> the fireworks. I want to talk about the fireworks displays because they, these are thousands and thousands of pounds every day. But they're not just normal. <laughs> these are electronically timed air compressed fireworks, MLS fireworks you could say, that go up to a split second depending on the wind. The, the evening, right, this is the magic, this is the castle, right? This is a 3D projection onto this building that's timed with music. The building is round, a 3D projection on a round building that's synchronised with music, synchronised, there are balls that go and interact with each little bit. Magic bands. We haven't had these yet, but when we go, we'll get magic bands, which are basically RFID stuff, and I just can't wait to hack them. <laughs> like, I, I've already been reading up on stuff, and I just can't wait to get locked out of my room because I've accidentally written to something. So, and so, why do we love it? And I guess it's just because I'm a big kid, and it's just it's just amazing. And we don't go with kids because they slow you down when you try to get to the <laughs> I'm not joking. Um, so, I mean. <laughs> that's, 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 I know you haven't learned anything, but go to Disney World, it's great. Thank you very much, John Hodgson.